You're listening to Satellite Sisters. What's a satellite sister? The person you call when the best thing in your life happens or the worst. The person that gets you up, gets you going, and gets you through. And every once in a while, changes your mind. This podcast is part pep talk, part weekly check-in. Like grabbing coffee with a friend. Thanks for being here. Welcome to the Satellite Sisterhood. You're listening to Satellite Sisters. It's great to be with you today. I'm Leon Dolan in Pasadena, California. I'm a writer, I'm a producer, I'm a podcaster, and I'm happy to be with my sisters today. Liz, where are you today? Where are you? Leon, funny you should ask. I am in beautiful Bend, Oregon. It's a gorgeous day here in Central Oregon. I'm going to be here for the 4th of July holiday. Super psyched to be here. And Julie, I hear it's like 10,000 degrees in Dallas. Yes, or it is. Doing there in your- yeah, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's warm. It's warm. Well, all, everybody's staying inside. We just hope this big heat dome moves off. I'm in Dallas, Texas. Um, okay, sisters, here's the question of the week. A reoccurring nightmare. Do you have one of those? Can I tell you that I woke up this morning in a panic because I had forgotten to apply to college? Yes, that's right. I forgot to apply to college. I woke up out of my bed. It was May 1st in my mind. I was like, well, maybe I can put throw something together and get into UT. That was my dream. Okay. Wow. What do you think that's about? I don't know. But that, how about you? Do you have reoccurring nightmares? You know what? I I didn't really until last week's news cycle. And I will now think about that submersible for the rest of my life. Oh. So that is now my reoccurring nightmare. As a claustrophobe, like I had a lot of elevator related nightmares and i think now they will be submersible related yeah, yeah that was a terrible terrible news story and terrifying for me liz well i don't really think of it as a nightmare but i do frequently dream that i am lost and circling around and around and around and just can't find the turn i'm supposed to be taking so oh that's travel anxiety that's you not being able to get to the airport on time <laughs> i'm I, I think it might even be deeper than that, Leah. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. Maybe our guest today can help us figure, help me figure that out. But yeah, Liz, we yeah. are talking to Chip Conley. He is the founder of the Modern Elder Academy. I know you're going to tell us a little bit more about yeah. his whole situation before we talk to him. But we are like taking midlife and we're shaking it up, aren't we? Shaking it up. That's what MEA does. They help guide you through midlife. So more on that later in the show. All right. Also today on the show, uh, we have a couple of entertainment stories. Um, First of all, I I don't know if you were aware, you guys, that we are in the middle of a Steely Dan renaissance or a Steely Steely Danaissance. And uh, the the millennials, the Gen Z, they've discovered the Dan and they love them. So I have some suggestions now that they they, if they want to further explore music of the 70s that might be underappreciated. I have three suggestions for them uh, for the next Steely Dan. And also we're going to talk about Barbie. I mean, Barbie, Barbie, Barbie. I know. It's all we hear about. I have super mixed feelings on that. Super mixed feelings. (laughs) I mean, enough, Barbie. Uh, (laughs) We'll just have to discuss. Yeah. But first, Julie, I mean, what the heck happened in Moscow and Russia this weekend? I mean, what, what happened? What, what happened? the heck? Okay, well, let's first of all, let's just start with the, uh, my qualifications. You know that a longtime listeners know that I used to live in Moscow for five years, but so have a lot of people. But then this story this weekend, I don't think many journalists or commentators can say that they have actually dined at the restaurant, the floating restaurant that Evgeny Prigozhin has in St. Petersburg. Uh-huh. I was in that restaurant, and I am not 100% sure. I'm about 90% sure that he was even there because there oh, was some wow. owner type that was super, super gracious and showing us stuff. And yes, so that is possible. Oh. I believe that I have an inside track on the hot dog <laughs> seller turned restaurant owner, caterer, warlord, or lord that led a coup against against yes. uh, uh, Putin's government. So, wow, that's a unique qualification, Julie. I didn't even know it was a floating restaurant. <laughs> See, I learned that already from you. Nobody I know. Else. It was, it was <laughs> actually President, President George W. Bush, 41, he dined on this boat as well. So, I mean, I was in Russia when there weren't that many restaurants. Right. So, yeah. you know, it was, 
it was we had we didn't have many choices. But and he wasn't a warlord at the time. Okay. Right. So, so but Putin it's... had recently come to power during the time you were living in. That's Russia. correct. That's yeah. correct. And as as we all know now that uh, Prigozhin is a very longtime friend. They call him the chef uh, and uh, an ally of Putin. So here's what I think about what happened in Russia. Okay, first of all. It's always about the money, okay? That this failed attempt uh, may be more of been a dispute about resources and finances. Keep in mind that Putin, Prigozhin, and Lukashenko uh, in Belarus that brokered this this peace deal or whatever, they're all billionaires, okay? That's important. These are these are battling billionaires, okay? We keep that in mind, I think, because. I think maybe he just got mad and decided to send, you know, a column of troops up the road, Liz, you know, that this was he was protesting or negotiating more than try, that, trying to take over the government. Okay. I mean, not to diminish it, but it does seem very old school just to, like, send a column of troops up the road. You know, I just like I was surprised at like the sort of mid 20th century feel of the whole thing here in the 21st century. But okay, I like I see your point. Yep. It could it could definitely have been about the money Prigozhin was under. They were, you know, they were trying to reduce his resources. And there is another group of mercenaries led by the Russian gas company, Gazprom, that was also co- trying to compete with Prigozhin's forces. So okay, so just just so the Russian gas company also has their own army? Yes, Liz. Yeah, okay. they're back, back, back by Russian gas money. Okay, so yeah, yeah, you got to get an army. Okay, so that's the first thing. <laughs> you got to get an army. army. Okay. okay, it's always about the money. Second thing is nothing in Russia happens that doesn't start in the Kremlin. Now, that's someone told me that when I first moved to Moscow, and I think that's true. I think maybe if it was a coup, possibly it was a coup. That maybe um, Prigozhin had hoped that allies in the Kremlin, members of the military or others were going to come forward. And when they didn't, hmm. that's he yeah. decided he started to put the brakes on to stop the column. Or hmm. here is my, here's really what I think is that Putin put Prigozhin up to this. OK, okay. That, and we'll, now we're getting to the good stuff. Right. right. I'll I'll get, get, okay. Liam, let's see. Okay, this is my. This is what I think. I think Putin put Prigozhin up uh, uh, for this. You you heard today we're uh, doing this podcast on Tuesday that Putin has decided that he's not going to punish Prigozhin in any way, and that um, I think he might have done it to root out other disloyal people in uh, in the Kremlin. That's what I think. Oh, uh, as a way of like flushing them out. Yes, yes. So let's see who's going to go along with this fake coup. Okay. Because uh, that may be possible. <laughs> all right. I know I shouldn't be laughing because these are all terrible people, but terrible. Yes. This yes. Is just unbelievable. Okay. Wow. Okay. And certainly, I think we have a long history at Satellite Sisters, uh, like do not drink the tea or stand by an open window. I have been talking about poison in the tea for yeah. years, for decades now. Okay. So... Uh, I say that's true. Really have to say that. I've been out front on that. I mean, I I heard a lot of those comments this weekend that what is Prigozhin going to do in Belarus? I mean, uh, again, according to news reports, he landed there this morning. Uh, I don't think he was, you know, I don't think he's going to stay there Uh, again. We're just going to have to see. But But where do you go if you're him? I I know we're going to see, but it just seems like having done what he did, there's no place for you to hide now. Good, good luck, because that's there's no place to hide from that. Uh, you know, and uh, also I, I'm always I always remember what Winston Churchill said about Russia. He said Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. Okay, and the longer I lived there, the less I understood. So right now, all the conventional wisdom here in the West is that this was a big loss for Putin. Like, oh, he's disgraced. He looks so weak. But is he really? I mean, he may actually have gained more um, because, A, he can stand up and say he stopped a civil war. Okay, he also now has access to those 50,000 well-armed, vicious fighters that were in the Wagner group. 
They're now folded into the army. And he has the West in a position where they're underestimating Putin's strength again. So you see, Ooh, okay, sure. just, now you're just, I'm just all sounds bad. <laughs> and all of, and every character in the story is a vicious thug, right? Yes. So, yeah. There's, there's no upside here, right? You're no, not, no, there's no upside there. This is a lot of volatility. Well, obviously in a country with nuclear weapons at war with Ukraine. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, it, just what we saw may not have been what really was happening. That's all. Okay. I, that's what I think. Okay. Sort of a Potemkin situation. Exactly. <laughs> yes, exactly. Whew. Okay. Well, you can watch that movie if you want to, if you want to understand that reference. Okay. Well, we have a lot, uh, there's going to be a lot to follow along here. Thank goodness we have you, Julie. We've said this so many times. It's amazing how much news comes out of Russia and thank goodness we have you. <laughs> all right. So I want to mention coming up next is a conversation with Chip Conley. Much more on the brighter side of the future, I got to say. And I'm very excited he's here. I interviewed Chip once before on my Workplace Advice podcast, Safe for Work. Remember that? Yeah. So it was in 2018 when his book, Wisdom at Work, The Making of a Modern Elder, came out. And um, Rico and I interviewed him. And I thought, wow. This guy has an amazing personal story and a lot of ideas to share. So finally, five years later, we have him on Satellite Sisters today. <laughs> Good work, Liz. <laughs> so Chip is the founder of MEA, which stands for Modern Elder Academy, but we can just call it MEA. And their mission they've laid out is to reframe midlife from a crisis to a calling to help people discover a renewed sense of purpose in their lives. So that seems like a good idea, doesn't it? Couldn't we yeah. add a little bit of yes, that? Please, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, please. So some of this happens. They have a beautiful campus in Baja. They also have live online multi-week classes on many themes, led by some really great um, thought leaders, as they say. And then in 2024, they're opening the first Midlife Wisdom School in the United States, and guess where it is? A place we love, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Sister. Oh, exciting. That's yeah, great. Cool. I know Santa Fe is right up your alley. Doesn't Santa Fe figure in your new novel, Liam? Yes, it is the setting of my new novel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so Chip's career path has been a really interesting one, so we'll hear about that, and also how MEA is out there to help people realize that we have more choices at midlife and beyond than we ever knew. So he's had a big life and he has a big laugh. Chip Connolly is up next. Hi, Satellite Sisters and Misters. Is it time to refresh your skincare routine? When is it not? Osea's Ocean Eye Serum is a great place to start because nothing says refreshed more than bright, wide awake looking eyes. Julie, I think that's your personal motto, isn't it? Well, it's not how I start in the morning, but it's it's my personal goal, Leon, to get bright, fresh eyes. And that's why I love the Osea serum. You know, it's got that ball applicator you yeah. just put on. Oh man, the bags, they they disappear. Yeah, you feel bright, fresh, and it's all natural. I love it. Would you say it brightens, smooths, depuffs, and awakens the entire eye area? Yes, Is that fair to yes say? it does. There's a lot of depuffing going on, and I'm, I am appreciate that. The Osea Ocean Eye Serum is like a shot of espresso for the eyes. We mentioned that cooling rollerball, just roll it around. And Ocean Eye Serum is clinically proven to brighten the look of eyes, reduce the look of crow's feet and under eye bags, diminish puffiness and dark circles, and smooth the look of fine lines and wrinkles because it uses high-performance ingredients such as hyaluronic acids, peptides, and their signature Undaria seaweed. Osea has been making these seaweed-infused products that are safe for your skin and the planet for 27 years. And we love that they are family-owned and run by a mom and daughter team. Thank you, Osea Malibu, for supporting Satellite Sisters. We love supporting your skincare line. Spring into your most radiant skin yet with clean vegan skin care and body care from Osea and get 10% off your first order site-wide with the code SATSISTERS at oseamalibu.com. And Osea is O-S-E-A. 
oseamalibu.com. You get free samples with every order and free shipping on orders over $60. Head over to oseamalibu.com and use code SATSISTERS for 10% off. Thanks, Osea. Welcome, Chip Connolly. You know, you have been on my mind since we last spoke five years ago, and that doesn't happen very often. It is just amazing to see what Modern Elder Academy has been up to. Congratulations. Thank you, Liz. I'm, I'm, I'm really honored to be with, with you and your sisters. And uh, yeah, let, let's talk about it. Yeah. Okay. So I, you're thinking about aging and wisdom and midlife, all of that. I feel like you really sparked a movement. But first, you need to start by telling us, what do you mean by modern elder? Because the first time I heard that phrase, yeah, which is probably five years ago when we spoke, I thought, wait one minute, wait, wait, stop right there. I'm not sure elder is the term I want for myself. So what is your definition of a modern elder? Well, let me give you a little origin story and I'll be brief. So I, for 24 years, I ran a, a boutique hotel company called Joie de Vivre. I started it when I was 26. I sold it when I was 50 uh, during the Great Recession. And I loved it for 22 of the 24 years. The last two or three years, I hated it, and I didn't want to be doing it anymore. Um, I went through what uh, would be called a midlife crisis. Um, yeah. I now call it a midlife chrysalis. We'll come back Ooh. to that. Ooh. Uh, Ooh. Yes, midlife chrysalis. So I got to the other side of that, and um, a couple of years after I sold the company, I was asked by the three young founders of Airbnb to join them uh, with their little tech startup that nobody had ever heard of to take it and make it into a global brand and global hospitality giant. And so within the first few months I was there, I realized, oh my God, I'm twice the age of the average person here. I was 52 at the time. Their average age was 26. They started calling me the modern elder. And I said, I don't, that sounds like a uh, magazine. I don't want to be yeah. a modern elder. <laughs> <laughs> but then they defined a modern elder for me. And they said, Chip, a modern elder is someone who's as curious as they are wise. Oh, when I heard that, I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I'll be that. Um, so long story short is we we use the acronym MEA mostly as opposed to the full Modern Elder Academy, partly because, yeah, being an elder yeah. sounds a lot like elderly. It's um, anything related to age has a certain amount of ageism built into it, in, especially in Western society. So, um, yeah, I, we are definitely trying to we claim the word elder, but I would say more what we're trying to reclaim is the idea that wisdom is, as you get older, the most valuable asset you have. And learning how to reframe your relationship with aging is essential. As Becca Levy at Yale has shown, if you can actually move from a negative to a positive perspective on aging, you gain seven and a half years of additional longevity. Really? So, yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I also feel like that thinking has moved from thinking about the second half of our careers to more holistically about the second half of our lives. Because yeah. you say you say you want to change the aging narrative from growing old to growing whole, Chip. That yeah. sounds awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. What it like? It's, it's, it's a, you're a marketer, so you so I should probably appreciate <laughs> you appreciate bumper stickers and that yes, um, bumper sticker slogans. So yeah, a couple thoughts here. Um, the average age of the people who come to, to MEA is 54, and about 64% are women. Uh, mm. So average age 54, we've got about 3,500 people who've come through our programs um, from 42 countries. We have 20. Wow. Countries. That's it's incredible. Chapters. So, I like yeah. that. So long story short is it's, it's people, um, we've got people as young as 28 and as old as 88, but 54 is the average. The average age is 54, but the average age that they think they're going to live till is 90. Mm. And here's the interesting math on this, Liz. If you are 54, you have 36 years of adulthood behind you, 54 minus 18 when you started being an adult. If you're going to live till 90, 90 minus 54 is 36 years. So 54 is exactly halfway through your adult life. And when you start to realize that, you start to realize, wow, yes, I better start thinking about both my career and my life from the perspective of I, I have a lot more ahead of me than I think I do. Yeah. One of the questions we like to ask at MEA is, what is it that you know now or have you done now that you wish you'd known or done 10 years ago? Um, Think about that for a minute. And then imagine, Liz, 10 years from now, what would you regret 10 years from now if you didn't do it or learn it now? And that's a really great frame for anybody. That's part of the reason that age 57, I started to learn how to surf. 
I started learning Spanish. Um, and you know, it's easy to get caught up in the mindset. I'm too old to fill in the blank. Um, and the reality is when you have that much life ahead of you, learning how to become a beginner over and over again is one of the most important skills we can have in midlife and beyond. Yeah, but we don't really like becoming be beginners again sometimes, right? It seems like <laughs> we know how to do all these things. Let's just keep doing what we know how to do. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Oh, no, you're right. You're right. I mean, it is. this is part of the reason why creating a program that helps people to come and feel comfortable being an idiot together um, being, being in, looking like an imbecile, whether it's lear <laughs> learning how to, how to juggle or learning how to surf or going out and doing your first yoga class or learning improv, or frankly, just learning how to talk from what we call the third vault. The first vault is the facts of your life. The second vault is the stories of your life. The third vault is the place most people don't get to in their life, which is sort of the essence of what's happening in your life. And to be able to meet people for the first time and get it within the first 24 hours to a place where like, oh my God, I'm conversing about stuff I don't even talk about with my spouse or my best friends. That is healthy because it opens up a channel to some stuff that's, you know, often stored or in like an archaeological digs deep inside of you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I feel like I need a new set of goals, you know, and, and you've written that midlife is when we begin to worry that our life isn't turning out as expected. And we may feel a sense of lost opportunity and frustrated longing. And for me, it's not so much lost opportunity, but the need to develop new opportunities that aren't so obvious. Like, what is my new list? As a single woman with no kids who is 60-something, those choices are not obvious. There's not like a standard list of things that I'm naturally going to do for the next 30 years. I feel like I need to start working on that, Chip. Okay, let's talk about it. Are you open to me asking you some questions? Oh, I love this. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. Do yes. it. Yes. We're very open to having you ask Liz questions. <laughs> I hope I hope surfing is the answer to everything. So go. Yeah. I think Leanne and Julie can ask questions too. I've been like, come on, like let's pile, let's pile on. Uh, okay. Okay. So uh, first of all, is there like if you go back to when you were an idealistic teenager or you know, when you went did you go to college, Liz? We're I went to Brown. You went to Brown. Okay. Yes. Good Ivy League. I was a I was a complete major at Brown Chips. So, you know, very pre-professional. Okay. Okay. <laughs> complete. Okay. Complete. I mean, what, what is, what are some dreams and hopes that you had from, you know, early in your life that you sort of put to bed because they weren't realistic? Um, mm. is, are there any, I mean, especially if you're complete, I mean, tell me more about how you like to write. You know what? It's uh. what... It, it's funny you put your finger on writing because I do feel like, I mean, obviously I've done some of that, some for Satellite Sisters, some professional writing, mm -hmm. but I, I've always felt like I should be doing more writing. And uh, Leanne, you're constantly bugging me to do more writing. Constantly, Chip. Like, okay. do more writing. I don't know why you don't want to put some of this stuff down. Yeah. And I don't remember most of the stuff I should have. That's done. okay. You'll... you'll... <laughs> Ten years from now, you'll remember less of it. Um, <laughs> so it's time to it's time to write. Um, okay, you got to find your medium. What in the medium? So let me let me. I, I have a I have a daily blog called Wisdom Well. I've and seen that. Yeah. When my one of uh, you know someone who was in a marketing team at MEA a few years ago said, "Chip, you know, I think it was four years ago." He said, "We're going to set up a daily blog for you." And I was like, "Well, I know my friend Seth Godin. Seth Godin and I went to business school together, and he has a daily blog, and I like his blog and." But man, what a commitment. Daily blog. I like writing longer things. I, I like writing books. I like writing, you know, longer essays. And he said, well, just let's, let's look at this. Let's explore it. Mm -hmm. And so what I came to realize is that I love writing a daily blog that is an average of about 300 to 400 words. I love it because, and I don't write it every day. I write, you know, 10 or 12 on a, a weekend just to get a supply out there for a couple of weeks. And I found that to be my medium. Now, my medium is not necessarily podcasting. My medium is not, uh, you know, necessarily mm -hmm. longer books. I have a book coming out in January called Learning to Love Midlife. And, but it's the shortest book I've ever written because I've come to realize like, I don't need to be like looking so academic. So learning to like, what is it? What's the medium? What's the medium that allows you to communicate? And, and if, if writing is the medium, great. Then what form of writing? Is it a blog? Is it a newsletter? Is it... Is it, um, you know, books? 
Uh, is it is it ebooks? Is it essays? And then you go yeah. with that. Yeah. Okay. So let's move yeah. on that. Second question. Um, so you have no kids. I get yeah. that. Yes. What when you think about the people who know you best, and not your sisters, not anybody in your family, but the people who know you best in your life? Think about it for a minute. Take a moment and write down their names, the five names, the, the five people who you would most reach out to beyond family if you really needed to have a serious conversation or you really wanted to have a deep conversation about something or something intimate. Okay. Now, do you have, do you have those five? I know that was quick. I have three. Is that okay? Three is fine. Okay. What, what are their ages relative to you? Are they, what percentage of those three or how many of those three are at least 10 years older or at least 10 years younger? Uh, Two are 10 years younger. Okay. okay. And one is a little older, but not 10 years older. But okay. well, two out of three are younger. Two or three are, two or three are at least 10. That's great. The, on average, when people do this exercise, four out of five people are within 10 years of either side, which uh-huh. I think just like we live in a very age segregated society. Mm-hmm. And so one of the thoughts I have for you is as someone who's had an amazing, you know, storied marketing career. And has you forged your life really in a really fascinating way? What are some ways for you to create some mutual mentorship relationships? Um, uh, what I call mentor, be a mentor and an intern at the same time with people who are younger than you. How could you find a way? And maybe you're already doing this. So if you are, then that's great. How could you find a way to create some intergenerational collaboration in your life so that you're going to learn from a young marketing person and you're going to teach them something too? What are the what's the what are the paths you could take, um, or the avenues that would allow for you to build those kind of relationships? Because I got to say that one of the most important things we need to look at in a world where we have five uh, generations in the workplace at the same time is how do we create like a generational potluck? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and does that <laughs> any appeal to that at, at all to you? Okay, not only does that appeal, Chip, I'm kind of getting chills as you're saying that because my sisters know. I am already working on that. I, I like the reason I was not on the show last week is because I was in New York. I'm working with this group of young uh, content creators who cover sports, uh, but don't have the kinds of doors in that they need. And so it's a program called the Magic Boost that I created with some people. And so we are training up the next generation of sports storytellers and particularly. Uh, from diverse voices who are not represented in the sports world very well. Yeah. So, yeah, that's your, and and I really, really love working with these 20 somethings because, and I'm learning so much as I work wow. with them. So, we live in an era where we all should be mentors, a mentor mm-hmm. and an intern at the same time. When I was at Airbnb, my, my boss was 21 years younger than me. Um, Brian Chesky, the CEO, but I was his mentor. So I was the in-house mentor to the CEO and co-founder. My job was to help him be, to become the best CEO possible because at age 31, he had never, I mean, he had no business background at all, but he was really hungry to become a great leader. So I was reporting to my mentee, <laughs> which mm-hmm. was unusual because mm-hmm. like, you know, how often does that happen? But it's going to happen more and more by the year 2025. Um, the majority of Americans will have a younger boss. So we're in. Oh, let that sink in. Yeah, let that sink in. <laughs> because, you know, but I, I have to say, I'm Gen X. You guys are boomers. I, you know, the people have a bad, uh, uh, you know, impression of millennials and Gen Zs. And I, I don't like that. I, I speak out against that. But people are not that happy to be bossed around by millennials and Gen Zs. Well, we can just going to have to get over it, huh? Well, we not just get over it, but help them. Like, yeah. How do we, you know, there's things that like what I used to say with Brian was, Brian, we have a weird trade alliance here. You offer me DQ, digital intelligence, and I offer you EQ and emotion. Uh-huh. Yeah. Part of my job was to help sort of amp up the psychological, you know, emotional intelligence of Brian as a leader while he was teaching me so much about just the, the digital world because I was a bricks and mortar boutique hotelier. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So we have, there's so much to be learned from each other. Uh, so yes, this is a big one. And then I'd say one last thing, uh, Liz, for you. 
what totally pisses you off or excites you that is a, a cause or a topic or something that you just feel like I've never really invested in that because I was too busy. And mm -hmm. now it, now it's time. And it could be something for your own personal growth too. It doesn't have to be, you, you know, know, uh, climate change. It could be whatever it is, but what's something that just like when you, when you, you get very animated about it, either in a form of excitement or in the form of being pissed off about it. Okay. I'll, I'll have to think about that a little bit. <laughs> On a I'm thinking bad customer service. Is that it? <laughs> yes. she, he gets pretty agitated about that chip. Yep. <laughs> okay. Well, that could be, I mean, maybe that's the book you're going to write. Maybe, maybe you're going to write the, a book about okay. the customer's point of view is the the, the handbook uh, for customer service delivered to you by a customer. Uh, <laughs> okay. That could okay. be it. Yeah, it's true. I do have a lot of strong feelings about these kinds of things. Like, like, why is this happening, people? Like, what is what is going on with this flow through this space? I don't understand. What's your What's your least favorite airline? Um. Okay, let me think. Because I have, I do have a few of them. You have a few. <laughs> yes, I do. I have really, really avoided things like Spirit. So, I, like, you. there's no. And I've also avoided Southwest just because. I know. I just don't like the festival seating in the Southwest situation. You can, you can, you can do it. You can you can buy up, you know, to the, what, what do you call it? The, like, business the, Select. Business Select. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, because he duly knows. Yeah. So I, I'm just going to go with Southwest then. I have not, the, the few times I've flown Southwest, I did not need the cheerful storytellers on the mic. I just Ooh, did not need that. The yeah. score of my flying experience. <laughs> Like, you know, I think in the early days it, it was really clever. And I think yeah. now all the airlines are trying to do it and they really need to, they need to send people to the, the Dolan school of humor, um, <laughs> to, to actually like get it, get it right. Because, you know, just because you're up there talking doesn't mean you're funny or, you know, it, like, thank you. Amen. I hear you. I hear you. Hey, yeah. I love them in Southwest. I disagree. I think they're great. And they put a, put a smile <laughs> on my face. You got to lean into that spirit. Okay. Uh, I'm I I'm a fan of Southwest because I I just I like the fact that they are very simple about what they do and it, it's like they have a they have a brand promise and it's like you know the freedom to fly and doing it affordably generally and it, yes to don't fly with them over last holiday season. No, no, they're not good at the holiday but season. They didn't do very well, but um, but yeah, okay, all right. So so Liz, I hope you didn't mind that process. No, I'm I'm. I'm amazed at how you zeroed in very quickly on things that are important to me mm -hmm. and that I've been really thinking about a lot. You know, here's the thing. Um, you know, there's this, there's adolescence as a word didn't exist until 1904. And then this guy, um, Stanley Hall, president of the American Psychological Association, wrote a book called Adolescence and said, hey, there's this life stage between childhood and adulthood in your teens, when you're going through emotional and hormonal and physical and identity transitions, we need to invest in that. And so as a result, you know, junior high schools and high schools sort of went public in a big way. And there were guidance counselors and there were child labor laws. There's a new life stage that's getting some attention in the academia, but not in pop culture yet, called middle essence. Middle essence. Middle essence. Middle essence is midlife when we're going through hormonal, emotional, physical, and identity transitions. And yet we as a society have done very little to provide people schools and tools and, and you know, uh, anything to practices that help people mm -hmm. to understand how do we cultivate our wisdom at this point in our life? You know, how, how do we move from a fixed to a growth mindset? Um, how do we navigate midlife transitions? We go through more transitions in midlife than any other era of adulthood. You know, like what, like you guys, like what are the- I, I would agree with that, Chip. You know, in fact, that was going to be my question to you because you're not always in control of these transitions. Uh, I was a trailing spouse and I found myself moving to Bangkok, Thailand. Mm -hmm. I didn't see that as part of my life plan. Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't what I, but I think that happens to a lot of people that- mm -hmm. Something in their life happens and all of a sudden you've got to make a pivot. You've got to decide I've got to live this life because that's what's in front of me. Um, and it doesn't always go according to what your original plan was. Yeah. I mean, well, think about it. So, so you changing location. That's something that happens in midlife. What else happens? 
Oh, yeah. empty nester. Yeah. Empty nester changed my job. Yes, I think menopause. Oh. Yeah, uh, yeah. All of these, all of these transitions. Parents, okay, taking care of our parents when parents, at yeah. the end of their lives. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. no, these were important things. Um, yeah, so having cool. grandchildren for me was a big was a big transition, a whole new role for me. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So our so the thing is we have, but we've done very little as a society to help people get a master's in transitions. So we, we at MEA, we talk about uh, TQ, transitional intelligence, and we're in the process of actually trademarking um, that term because learning how to actually master transitions or navigate them at least is really important in life, especially in an era where, gosh, 50 years ago, um, in the course of your career, you had three jobs. Today, you have 13 jobs in the course of your mm-hmm. career. Mm-hmm. And Life is happening faster and in a more uncertain, crazy kind of way. So helping people to understand that there are three stages to any transition. There's the ending of something, there's the messy middle, and then there's the beginning of something new. And then help people understand, we can help teach you how to go through any transition in a more adept and accelerated kind of way. Um, And that's part of what we do at MEA because, Mm -hmm. and that's part of, we have, we even have a, a, an ebook that's free that's called The Anatomy of a Transition. So I, I really believe this. And I, you know, unfortunately, I lost five friends to suicide in midlife during oh the Great Gas. Oh, how terrible. All of the men, all of, age 42 to 52, oh. three, three of the five of them were entrepreneurs. And it all happened between 2008 and 2010. And I got to say that when I really look back and say, what was going on for my five friends? And none of them were related to each other. So they were not, you know, it wasn't like that one did it. And then, oh, well, then they decided they, none of them even knew each other. Some of them were college friends. Some of them were business school friends. Some of them people were, were people I worked with. What was going on was they were going through a lot of transitions and, and the Great Recession was, you know, pretty punishing. Mm-hmm. And they didn't know how to navigate those transitions. And in, and in the case of men, they're not nearly as adept as women in terms of talking what's going on inside of themselves. And um, why do you think that is? Well, we're, we, that's how we were brought up. I mean, boys don't cry. You know, I, I like I, I grew up in a family. My dad was a captain in the, in the Marines and like, boys don't cry, dude. I was the only, you know, that was the oldest son. I was Stephen Townsend Conley Jr. Chip off the old block. <laughs> oh, wow. I was supposed to be just like my dad. You didn't talk about your emotions, et cetera. So, I mean, at a young age, and there's a lot of books right now coming out about, you know, this, how men are struggling as adults in, in especially in American society. But, I, I, but what's interesting is how needy, how much men need the opportunity to be vulnerable and to learn to how, how to build the muscle of developing social wellness. So social wellness means how do you use other people in your life as emotional insurance? We have property and liability insurance for a rainy day for our home, but you know what's where's our emotional insurance for a rainy day for our life? And mm-hmm. for for women, have it generally more than men because they are women are better at being at developing social wellness. It's interesting the word wellness starts with the letters we w e, and the word illness starts with the letter i. <laughs> um, and women are more of a we culture and men are, yeah, was, these are gross generalizations. Let's not start by saying that. No, no. Yeah. Men are more of an I culture. Uh, and, I, you know, starting with the letter I. And so that, you know, that's an important part of what happens in midlife is men start feeling irrelevant. They start feeling impotent. And I'm not just talking about in their romantic life, but they start feeling like their best years are behind them. Women Women actually feel invisible. So it's, it's irrelevance versus invisibility. <laughs> That's so, so interesting. <laughs> That's so, I'm not sure which is worse. Yeah. Huh. <laughs> I pick invisible. I'm picking invisible, Liz. I'm picking okay. invisible. So, so I want to hear, hear, hear from the three of you now. Talk about invisibility in midlife and beyond. 
Okay, Leon, you go first. Well, I just, yeah, the expectations are zero. You realize at one point, like when you get, I, I found it most profoundly when I was getting dressed to go to a wedding, like for the first time of a, you know, a, of a 20 something. And I realized like, oh my gosh, not a single person at this wedding is going to be looking at me. You know, no one's like, I mean, most weddings are tough, but as you're a 50 year old woman, no one is looking at you ever. I, I just talk, I to, my, I talk to myself all the time out loud. I, I don't even listen with earbuds <laughs> to things because I think no one's paying attention to me. I'm just a 50-year-old woman walking around the Rose Bowl listening to podcasts. No one cares. So, well, you know, there's something kind of good about it. You, know, you yeah. can just do your own thing. Yeah, yeah. Is there a power of invisibility? Yeah, I think there is. I think there is. Yeah. You stop caring. It, you know, comes with sort of a relaxing of other people's judgments. You stop thinking about her. that's going to matter to me more. Oh boy, you know, this five pounds is really going to destroy my life or, yeah. oh, well, my roots are, are, are on, you know, have need touching up, but no one cares. So, <laughs> so that's good. It's a problem when you walk into a professional situation and you feel like you're just being cruised right over, but, yeah. um, you know, you start to feel that too in a different way. Yeah. The, the, the study, studies out of Harvard have shown that women gain confidence in their fifties um, in, in a professional setting. Whereas men, it, it, it has ebbed and started to decline. Mm -hmm. Again, these are averages. So like, I want to make sure there's definitely the women have to deal with ageism and sexism at the same time. That's harder. Uh, but what happens with men is really interesting. Men become their own worst enemy more so than even women, uh, in the sense that, yeah, in the dating sphere, it, you know, men, have, men are lucky, you know, the silver fox. No one talks about no one talks about the silver vixen, <laughs> but uh, we're going to start that though. That's a good idea. <laughs> I, 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 why don't you get on that? That, <laughs> that could be really helpful. That's a lifelong marketing project, Julie. Yes, good idea. There you go. <laughs> but for men, what happens is that they the irrelevance shrinks them and makes them. Whereas women might just say, "Fuck it," you know. I I don't give a fuck, you know anymore. Excuse me, if I'm, I'm not supposed to swear on the podcast. You, know, um, you don't say uh, it. Too late. They're stumbling uh, out. Uh, FYI. Uh, so, whereas for a man, they just shrink and drink. And um, not to say that women don't drink more in, at that age too, but shrink and drink. I've never said that before. Wow, this is the first time. They shrink. Okay, TM. Drink uh, that. Yeah, shrink and drink. And what happens is they just start to um, it, like evaporate and get crankier um huh. and partly it's because the world isn't operating the way that it used to women had to deal with ageism from a young age right men the, especially if you're a straight white man in your 50s the very first time you're dealing with any kind of ism is dealing with ageism in your 50s and you are not mentally or emotionally prepared for it yeah. mm. that that is fascinating. Never thought about that before. Look at you raised so many super important issues in such a short time. You know, MEA definitely has it going on. So I feel one thing I learned here today is that Satellite Sisters and the Satellite Sisterhood, it's not just a podcast, it's a social wellness enterprise. Now, now Chip, now I now I feel like we know that's always been what we've been about. We've said like the whole point of Satellite Sisters is the sound of friendship and talking about anything that friends talk about. So that really is social wellness. So thank you. you. you and go. it has been such a pleasure to connect again and uh, inspiring, I'm sure, for the whole far-flung uh, sisterhood. So we look forward to working more together. Thank you, yeah, Chip. Yeah. Make life and yeah. beyond. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, gals. It's it's great to connect. And yeah, let's do a Satellite Sisters workshop. Uh, let's do Baja it. Baja or we're opening in Santa Fe next March. Uh, like, yeah, let's do one. We Santa Fe. That. Santa, Santa Fe. Vicky and Santa Fe. Hensel us in. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Chip. All thank right, you thank so you much, Chip Connor. Thanks, Chip. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Hi, Lee and Dolan here from Satellite Sisters, and I just wanted to ask, have you bought your ticket yet for Satellite Sisters Big Fun Weekend? We would love to see you in Minneapolis in 2023. We are all getting together for some big fun, October 13th, 14th, and 15th, and we would love to have you. Bring a friend, make a friend. It's a Satellite Sisters Big Fun Weekend. Two nights of 
getting together and partying and a Mamma Mia dance party and a live show and all kinds of other fun activities and a lot of just hang time with your Satellite Sisters. So here's what you do. Head on over to SatelliteSisters.com. Tickets are still available. All the details are there, right there on the homepage. Satellite Sisters Big Fun Weekend. Join us. Okay, we're back, Liz. It was great to talk to Chip Connolly. I can see why he's been on your mind for five years. Cause yeah. The work he's doing with the Modern Elder Academy is pretty inspiring. Pretty, yeah, yeah, yeah really thoughtful. Pro provocative, right? Yeah. So, you know, all the all of the MEA links are in our show notes. So if you want to check it out yourself, they have a lot of stuff online where you can see what their classes are. You can see who some of their, their teachers are. Anyway, check it out. It's all going to be in the Satellite Sisters show notes for this episode and on the blog at SatelliteSisters.com. Liz, I just want to say again, 300 words a day from you would be great. That's, I'm just going <laughs> to... Okay. All right. He said we need to understand what it's like to work for a younger boss, and we've been working for Leanne the whole time we've been doing this podcast. All right. I want to uh, let people know in July, uh, July 18th, we're going to be doing an Ask Us Anything show. Okay. So that's where you get to ask the questions and we get to answer them. We're going to start a thread in the Facebook group. Uh, so you can put your questions there. But if you want to email us, we do have an email address. It's totally functional. And Liz knows how to retrieve it. So you can email <laughs> us your questions at Hello at SatelliteSisters.com. Um, that show is going to tape July 18th, and then we'll play that during our hiatus in August. We always take a few weeks off in the summertime to have a proper summer vacation, but we will have a fresh Ask Us Anything show. So again, hello at SatelliteSisters.com. Any questions you may have for us uh, as a group or individually, go ahead and send it through. And we'll compile those and put together a great show for everybody. It's going to be fun. We haven't done that in a while. No, no. You know what? We haven't. That's why we decided to do it. I was like, hey, we should do an Ask Us Anything. It's been a while. <laughs> All right. A couple of entertaining stories uh, for you here. Um, not so many recommendations, but we just we have some entertaining sisters that are more news stories. So you guys, I don't know if you were aware that Steely Dan has become wildly popular now with millennials. And no, Gen Z. I didn't know this. I'm very excited about that. Yeah. I always love Steely Dan. Leanne. Right. I'm happy that it's now cool to like them again. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Reeling in the years has become a real like TikTok anthem. And, you know, they're discovering everything that Steely Dan has to offer. Um, and uh, what's interesting is that Steely Dan always had the rap of like not being a great touring band and they're. Their professional reputation really fell off. Like there are people that loved him in the 70s, they had a couple big albums, but they are not a band that has sustained a lot of popularity. You know, it's not like oh. Bruce Springsteen. And they never right. toured. That was always the rap on Steely Dan, that they were not really a touring band. They were a studio band. So this Steely dan has come as like kind of a lovely midlife, end of life surprise for, for the boys at Steely Dan. Of course, we lost one a couple months ago. But anyway, I want to let millennials and Gen Zs know that there are plenty of Steely Dan like bands where you could rediscover them and it would be totally worth your while. I actually spent Friday night going through music on Spotify, identifying songs and, and musicians where I felt like Gen Z should take a listen, right? Okay. Oh, so, oh, Liam. Because oh, they yeah. added a Steely Dan vibe to them? Yeah, a Steely yeah. Dan vibe, but also that same sort of thing like, had a big album, had a big moment, but somehow like professionally didn't couldn't sustain, but also the the damn vibe. Now I'm gonna start with an absolute Dolan family fave. Uh and, and that is Boz Skaggs. Okay. Oh my God. So oh. degrees, are you kidding me? So oh, I love that. Yeah, that's he was part of my anthem. Yeah, there. Yeah, that is why. And Julie, I challenge you just to listen to Silk Degrees again, start to finish. You are gonna sing along to every single song. <laughs> And if you're a millennial or Gen Z, just head right on over to the Lido Shuffle. It's got oh gosh, that is the best. Okay, it's propulsive. It's got a good buildup. It's got some lyrics you don't really know what they mean about Shy Town and Hammer Down and Let It Go. I mean, you you don't know what's happening with the Lido Shuffle. And then it's got that great chorus about Lido. It's a sing along anthem. It is. Yeah, no, I know. Like, I know. If you enjoy Reeling in the Years, you will enjoy the Lido Shuffle. Also, a couple of other good tunes over there on that album that, that you might want to discover. 
but okay. that's that's my number one pick. Okay. Okay. Number two pick. Uh, because you know who else had a little like the Gen Z's millennials discovered her a couple of years ago, thanks to her Christmas song River, was Joni Mitchell. You know, oh, she no. has had a, a a Joni Mitchell songs, you know, uh, and because that song River is in every single like YA movie on Netflix. I don't know if you know that, but it's <laughs> you know, that's a requirement. That's a requirement. Yeah. And that's the only maybe song they know from Joni Mitchell, but that's fine. So if Joni Mitchell is your gal, I'm begging you, begging you to listen to Ricky Lee Jones. Oh, I'm I was begging you. Oh, yeah, totally, totally. I need the first two albums. Again, start to finish. Not a bad song in the bunch. Got a lot of jazzy tunes. You got some ballads. You got some Chuckies and love. Chuckies you know, and love. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Leon, Leon, you on. see what you're doing? You have become an elder music leader <laughs> right here on on the satellite sisters, that's it's it happening. You're, you're bringing leading. the wisdom, bringing the yes, wisdom. She is. She's <laughs> leading the younger generations. Thank you. And I believe you, you elder, <laughs> elder sister. <laughs> you're welcome. We even went to see the great Ricky Lee Jones at Carnegie Hall of all places. We did. It was my first concert. You took yeah. me when I was like fourteen. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. See, got you started right. Started yeah. right. Okay. And then last one. Um, you know. Uh, when, um, um, oh my gosh, Tina Turner died a couple weeks yes. ago. You know, she, she was simply the best. We all know that. We're going to make yes. that, you know, make that cliche again. But you know who was also fantastic in 1979 and was a Dolan family fave that we washed a lot of dishes to? Donna Summer. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Oh, come right? I yes. mean, yes. that album, Bad Girls, in summer of 1979, we couldn't get enough of it. I just, again, I challenge you, if the Tina Turner simply the best, you've been like, oh, that's great. Again, you all know it because of Shit's Creek. You know, you don't really know because of Tina Turner. Take a listen to Bad Girls. I'm begging you to listen to Dim All the Lights. I mean, that oh, is a oh, great wow. disco mm-hmm. song. So there you yeah. go. There are your three boss, ca- boss cags, Ricky Lee Jones and Donna Summer. I, they all deserve a renaissance. And uh, I hope millennials and Gen Z discover them. Okay. Um, but feel free to contribute your own. If you have any, feel free to contribute your own on the Satellite Sisters Facebook page. And then, you know, just a, a brief uh, a brief discussion of our girl, Taylor Swift. I mean, she has brought so much joy to my life in the last few years. My entire timeline is almost all Taylor Swift content from her <laughs> concerts, whether it's actual people I know who have been all over the country or just suggested for you. It's just one Taylor scene after another. OK, so but you know what? Fortune Magazine identified last week there's something they're calling the T-Swift lift. She she has brought, they estimate, thanks to her era's concert tour going from city to city, an extra $5 billion into the U.S. economy. If you want wow. uh, they took a look at Nashville very closely. I'll put a link to this article. And But if you take a look at, like, you know, air travel, hotel rooms, restaurants, you know, even retail around the the concert yeah because you have to have a Taylor Swift outfit you have to have your outfit never yeah like I, that five billion dollars five billion dollars the T Swift lift so Taylor we love you keep going <laughs> keep doing it it's great it's great <laughs> keep it going T Swift okay uh now another trending entertainment story what the kids would call the Barbie of it all that's what I, I would just like to talk about the Barbie of it all there is an onslaught of all things Barbie. And I, I'm just going to take you through my emotional journey with Barbie, um, <laughs> with, the, with the Barbie movie. So what, what is the yeah, word? Be clear. It's the, the movie. The movie. The movie. Is coming out. Not the yes. doll. Not the, okay. No, no, no. I'm talking about the movie. So that's what I was, here's my journey. Originally, I said, they're making a movie about Barbie. Okay, there's no way I'm going to see that. That just seemed off the table. But then I thought, oh, it's directed by Greta Gerwig. Okay, well, I love her. I love Lady Bird. I love Little Women. All things Greta, although, well, then I have to support it. So, so, so then I was going that way. But then my Instagram feed was all of a sudden just bombarded with nothing but Barbie images. And once again, I'm like, I'm out. Enough. Stop with this. And then I realized, well, wait a minute. Ryan Gosling is in it playing Ken. Hmm. Provocative. Maybe I do need to look into this Barbie movie. You know, and then now everything is just turning to pink. It's just so pink. It's so much pink. I just, so I'm super on the fence about this. 
Uh, you guys can try to direct me one way or the other. But Julie, how are you feeling about the purview of it all? Well, Liz, let me ask you, do you feel like you're going to compromise yourself, your uh, your well-being if you go see the movie? No, no. I, I, I think I just have a natural resistance to, to things that are just such a, a marketing onslaught. Yeah, overly commercial. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but it's but everything about it seems like, okay, well, if it's Greta and if it's Ryan and if it like, it's probably going to be super interesting. But I would just like them to just back off a little bit and let me decide. Yes. No. Okay. Okay. I just don't feel like we were very strong Barbie. We oh. weren't because our mother didn't allow the Barbies in the house. She had a yeah. very and she had a very strong rule about it because she didn't like all those nude Barbies lying around on the floor. That's what she said in just that voice. Okay, right. So we would have to go to our cousin's house, the Morning Stars, to play with Barbies. That's all I wanted was a Barbie. Never got one. Okay. So I think I'm in on the movie, Liz. Okay. okay. I think right. I'm gonna get some gal pals. Okay, I might have might have a nice glass of rosé, pink wine before I watch. <laughs> oh, that's a good idea. Okay, okay. so you're just going to throw yourself with the theme and go. Just, with it. just throw yourself in. Yeah, yeah. I don't wear pink. It's not really my color, but uh, but I think you just yeah. That's what I would say. Yeah. I'm... <laughs> okay. What I like is that this Barbie movie is up against the Christopher Nolan movie Oppenheimer. And yeah. I, when I say up against, like it's only people in Hollywood that care about this. But yes. Like the. Two movies are opening on the same day and they could not be, you know, more different. So that the fact that this head to head competition has also broken out between the Oppenheimers and the Barbies, <laughs> I think that's very funny, too. So I may go to the movie just to support this idea of like, let's bring the movies back. Let's bring the box office back. Let's just carry on with this idea that Barbie versus Oppenheimer is like a funny concept. So, uh, and I love, and I love Greta Gerwig, but um, yeah, I don't feel that strongly about Barbie per se. Like, yeah. I feel like this could be like maybe a 10 minute movie. So I don't know how she's going to string it out. <laughs> 90 minutes, but okay. that's so okay. funny. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Liz here, here's what I would suggest because there was a headline in the New York times this week that said Barbie core is surging. Okay. that. The Barbie thing is now in uh, in home design, pink appliances, wallpaper, accent pillows, rugs, shutters. The hot, hot color for the summer is hot pink. It's fuchsia. It's magenta. OK, there is even an official Barbie pink. So maybe you should just get some accent pieces in your house to see <laughs> how you feel about pink. OK, <laughs> Maybe a little pink pillow, okay? What? What is that? Couldn't be. That couldn't be. I don't know about that. I, uh, but I did notice that they they transformed. There's like a, an actual Malibu beach house. Yes, it's Malibu that they decked out. Right? Did yeah. you read about that? Yes. Right. Yes. Decked the whole place out. But people are just they're going to this Barbie core decor because it's kind of a refuge from the modern farmhouse. Okay. No more white subway tie. <laughs> Okay, put up a hot pink shower curtain, Leon. I know you can do it in your house. And just see how that feels. Maybe that will help you decide about the movie. <laughs> okay, well, okay. well, I do want to support movies made by women and, and, and I guess starring a woman. Yes, so, okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> starring a woman. <laughs> All right, let us know. Let us know how you feel about Barbie. Hello at SatelliteSisters.com, or you can always join the Satellite Sisters Facebook group. Um, we'd love to have you. You just have to search search us on Facebook and answer a few questions. You really do have to answer the questions because we want to make sure that the group is people that actively listen to the show and sort of understand the values of the show. Uh, it, it is not required that you feel strongly about Barbie one way or the other, but we'd love to have you. We'd love to have you. All right. Uh, next week is the 4th of July. We are taking the day off, but don't worry because we put together a fresh, hot show for you. It's Barbie free. Uh, we are going to be talking to the authors of one of our Satellite Sisters Best Beach Bike Books pick, The Better Half. Really fun to talk to them about this, like, kind of zippy book about a woman in midlife who seems to have it all and then things just start happening. We really things get complicated. Yes. 
So it's great to have a mid a middle-aged protagonist in this book. Uh, there's a lot of humor in the book. There's some romance. There's friendship. And it was super fun to talk to the co-authors about writing The Better Half, Ali Frank and Asha Yeomans. So we talked to them. And we're going to get you all set up on zucchini. Jewel, I know you're not a fan. Uh, Liz said she's not a fan. But I think after you listen to Cynthia Graubart uh, talk about her book, Zucchini Love, you're going to get on the zucchini train. All right. And that while on the zucchini boat, is that what you're saying? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Just had no, that was good. I was thinking I had made a sexual reference, so I was trying to bail out. Uh, but no, zucchini boat. You're going to get on the zucchini boat. Fantastic. Uh, so that's next week's show. It's a fresh new show for you that will uh, be available on July 4th. All right. We want to thank our engineer, Sergio Enriquez. Thank you, Sergio, for everything. We hope you have a great holiday. Thanks uh, to our graphic designer, Emily Borgine. That's right. She has a new last name. She's been married. Emily, thank you. We appreciate that. Uh, and we appreciated the sound spelling in your email to help us <laughs> first pronounce your new name. Thanks to our sponsors and thanks to you who support the sponsors that support us. It's a really, really important thing to do. And we appreciate everybody that uses the special URLs and the codes. It makes this possible for us to do this show. Also, if you like Satellite Sisters, please share Satellite Sisters. Yeah. It's so easy. It's ideal, to- and Right from the app that you're listening to. Tell your satellite sisters about the show simply by messaging them a link uh, to the show. Maybe, maybe this particular show you really enjoyed. Go ahead, message your satellite sisters and misters uh, to listen to the show. We would love that. Love that. All right. Uh, to do list. What what do people have? Liz, what do you have? Well, you know, Fourth of July coming up, Leanne. It's all about the Thunder shirt. <laughs> of course, for those of us who own dogs, which is all of us. You know, the 4th of July is the worst day of the year. Yeah. And um, it's uh, like they, the, the algorithm must know I'm a dog owner. I guess it sees pictures of Hooper. And I've gotten nothing but Thundershirt ads in my feed for the last, <laughs> for the last two weeks. And I did notice that they have a brand extension. They have a dog calming chew now called Thunder Wonders. So you might want to consider the Thunder Wonder uh, along with the Thundershirt. Good. I will. Yep. I'll take it. I'll take it. Well, you know, it was 4th of July, so it means it's blueberry muffin season. Yes. Well, blueberry muffins have become a great Satellite Sister tradition. I will be posting that recipe everywhere. It will be in pep talk. And I will be making some blueberry muffins this weekend. So I'm looking forward to that. How about you, Jewel? Well, me too. Uh, uh, yes to the muffins, but I'm, I've also started my festooning. Uh, that would be uh, just decorating for the 4th of July. I'd like to get the American flags out early and uh, festoon. <laughs> That's such an excellent word, festoon. It's so festive. <laughs> uh, all right, sisters. That's the show for this week. Have a great week. You too, Leanne. And don't forget, call your satellite sister. <laughs> <laughs>